I would like to take you for a long journey down to Africa, to West Africa. And I will talk about the outbreak of a disease down there, which started much even before 2014. But I would like you to keep in mind one thing, that even though I'm going to speak about one particular disease, the Ebola virus disease, I would like you to think that these kind of situations are very similar, are very likely to happen with whatever the virus can be, with whatever other disease and whatever other crisis you might hear about. So, untold stories. I would like to begin with the idea that we think of the Ebola as a disease, right? As a virus, that's completely normal. And even though now it's slightly disappeared from our TVs, from our media, from the news, the disease is still down there and it's still going. Three countries in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia were struggling up until these days are still in the fight against this disease. But actually, apart from the disease, this is a much wider, much more complex crisis. And this is exactly what I would like to talk about. So let's begin with the schools. Around five million of children in West Africa were banned from schools because the schools were closed up for the time of the epidemics. That was six to eight months. Imagine that your younger brothers or sisters, that perhaps you or perhaps your children cannot go to school for more than half a year. That's a disaster for the system. They are, devoted, they are devoid of the education, and we already heard a few times, even today, what a powerful weapon education is. So since the, the schools were closed up, not only because of the disease, because people were afraid to spread the disease, but also because the, those schools, the buildings, were transformed into some kind of uh, health centers or mobile hospitals, let's say, or like health centers were to cure Ebola patients. Another thing, economy. Ebola outbreak was, as any other crisis you can think of, think of, it's a war. It was a war against the humanity, against the people, the societies down there in Africa, in the Western Africa. So the, econ the economy of those countries was severely hit, severely struck by this. There are special conferences, special meetings organized now these days just to raise those three countries from this economic crisis. But where did it come from? Actually, a disease like this, an outbreak like this, means that, for instance, the frontiers, the, the borders of the countries are closed up. There is no economical exchange. The transportation is very limited. There is no tourism. No one would go for a holiday to these kind of countries, right? So another aspect. It's not something that pops up in our mind immediately when we hear Ebola virus disease, right? But the economies were very much touched by this what was going on around the disease. Next, I would like to mention food. Probably not many people know because that's not common knowledge and no one should uh, require that kind of knowledge. But I would like to tell you that the Ebola is most likely spread through the bushmeat. The bushmeat means the animals that people in Africa, in West Africa, can catch in the bushes. So these are, for instance, monkeys. These are, for instance, some types of antelopes. There are some types of monkey and bats, bats, fruit bats. So these mammals, these animals, are one of the probable vectors of this disease. And this was one of the reasons why it was spread so widely in this part of Africa, in West Africa, because people eat bushmeat. They eat the, like, like chicken, like we do uh, here in Europe with, uh, with ducks, with chicken, and other types of uh, available meat. So people by eating it, most likely were transferring the disease. And all of a sudden, they were not allowed to hunt for this kind of food source. Besides, as I already mentioned, the, bar the, the borders were closed, so people could not really easily exchange the goods, buy the food from other countries, from other regions, because there was also very strong control around certain regions of these three countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. So there's another thing, another problem, another element, another piece of a puzzle in this crisis. There is no food. And we keep still thinking about the disease, the virus, people getting ill, but people getting impoverished, people getting poor because of this whole critical situation. Healthcare. In the context of Ebola virus disease, we say healthcare, we think of this disease. But that is very let's say limiting when thinking just about that. The crisis of healthcare 
in, in the context of Ebola crisis is a much broader, was a much broader problem, it still is. Now these countries are taking, are suffering from the aftermath of this huge outbreak which started last year because not only the, the Ebola virus was spread around, but also the problem with other diseases, the vaccination for other diseases, for instance, was stopped. The measles is on the rise. So the international societies, organizations, international bodies like WHO, Medicines Sans Frontières, they are discussing how to actually tackle the fact that the vaccination stopped for so many, young, for so many children and people in West Africa because so much interest was focused to this one disease, very important, very critical, dangerous, killing disease, but still many other things were neglected. For instance, on the surge, on the rise, were also diseases like cancer, like diabetes, mental diseases. People were suffering from all other types of diseases because so much attention was streamed into this one particular goal, of course with a purpose, but with countries with those particular three countries in West Africa, which were completely unprepared, well, let's say poorly prepared for this kind of a crisis coming from Ebola, it was a very strong hit to now try to just focus all resources, all people to this one particular target. Around 500 doctors died throughout the crisis. 500 doctors died in West Africa. There were also foreigners, people coming from, from Europe, from United States, but also local healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, midwives, and so on. 500 people, doctors, healthcare workers died. These are not countries who have a lot of healthcare professionals. For 100,000 people here in Lithuania, you have around 400 doctors. There you have 12. So you see, there is this big discrepancy. And they already were the voice of a hundred more doctors and other healthcare workers. So that's another part of the crisis. These people will not be replaced immediately. And now people getting ill with other diseases. And I'm talking also in general about other outbreaks in the world which take place several times in our history. This is what happens. There are no doctors, there are no healthcare workers. What happens then? Other diseases come in because there is nobody to cure them, to take care of the patients. So keep this in mind. Doctors, as I said, so many came to Africa and also died there or took the disease. Some of them also took it out of Africa, but there were very few cases. And you could also see one of the reasons why actually Ebola didn't spread so much in other countries. There were a few cases in Europe, few in the US, but literally few. And this is also one of the reasons for that is because our healthcare system are so strong, are so well equipped. Sometimes we maybe don't appreciate it or sometimes maybe you need a comparison with other countries to see in, such, in what privileged situation we live. Sex. So Ebola also got into the beds of people, into the sex life of people who got ill or who lived on the territory where the crisis outbreak took place. We were thinking until this outbreak, because it's not the first one, it's actually the biggest one, but it's not the first big outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. So until now we were thinking that the virus can live in semen, in sperm for three months, but we were wrong. It turned out just with this epidemic that up to three, nine months, up till nine months, the Ebola can be spread through sexual intercourse. And we just found out now. And how we found out? Because some people, some young people, let's say, having sex together after the album, after they thought they are safe, they having sex and they transmitted the Ebola. So you see how much this disease and any other disease of this kind or any other crisis can get into personal lives, into kitchen, into bedrooms, into living rooms of people who are living in the bad times, in the bad moment, perhaps. Fear. Many people on the land, in the field, in the place where the Ebola outbreaks were, was taking place, they didn't want to go to the hospital. They didn't want to go even with the symptoms. They were for a very long time in denial, for instance. They didn't want to go to any kind of health centers because people died there, right? 
because we hear people die in the hospital. So if I go, well, I will go for sure, die for sure. So this kind of thinking, perhaps you would say very primitive, it seems to us primitive thinking, but this kind of way of, this kind of logic was also in prevail during this crisis in West Africa, that sometimes even military had to be mobilized and in general societies and governments in order to explain to people that please, coming for you to come to the hospital when you have fever and you have headaches, when you're vomiting, when you're feeling all of a sudden ill, that's your only chance and the only chance for your family, for your loved ones to be safe. So please try to control this fear, but it's not easy. It's easy to speak here today now to you educated, well-educated well young Europeans, it's easier to talk to you now about this today, but it's much more complex, much more tricky to explain this to people in certain areas of the world. Isolation. You know, the quarantine, the, con the, the concept of a quarantine is like putting people away, isolating the source, sometimes a few people also from the surrounding of a person, in order not to spread the disease further. But as I said, it's not so easy. It's not so easy because people are afraid, and even until the last days, people were denying the Ebola in these regions. They were saying, ah, oh, it's not happening. It's not really affecting us. And now thinking here, like, how many times do we think in our life, like, no, HIV doesn't really affect us, right? It's not really my problem, or this crisis, this financial problem, washing hands in the hospital, for instance, this really doesn't touch me, but actually it's this very critical example of this disease in West Africa perhaps can be transferred to many other things that we are being warned from, right? Like we are being protected from by the media, by the social campaigns. I thought of HIV, perhaps it's a good, good example. Rituals, I think that's one, one is my favorite in a bet. It's, it, well, in a good sense, maybe, but most interestingly, I think, is here to mention that people in Africa and also in, actually everywhere in the world, we have certain rituals of burying people, right? When people die, some of us, like, I don't know, I'm a Christian, so we have a ceremony uh, in, the, in the church, right, where the corpse are being taken out and then to the graveyard. Also in Africa, they have their certain uh, ceremonies and burial rituals. And they, they, these kind of rituals include, for instance, touching, caressing the person who died. And this is completely not allowed with a person who, might, who is suspected of dying from Ebola. So people all of a sudden were said, you cannot put, say goodbye to your husband, wife, or a child in a way you've been taught, or in a way you would like to. Now these guys in big white suit will come and take away the body and you will never see the person again. So again, the disease that we just think a medical condition comes into the very personal layers of life of every person in these countries. And now stigma. Around between 30 and 70 percent, okay, on average 50 percent of people who are infected with Ebola, depending on the initial condition, on the situation, they, they survive, okay, it's 50-50 more or less depending on the region, depending on the body condition, 50-50. But even if they survive, thank God, it's not over for many of them. Even if someone is released from the hospital, they sometimes go back to their hometowns, they come to their small villages, and then they meet people who are very, very hostile towards them because they still don't know if they are fully cured. Again, education is the key, perhaps some social campaigns, but we're talking here about a different social system, different, with different mentality, different societies. It's not so easy. Even here, among the European societies, now we see how much the situation changes toward migrants, for instance, right? How much stigma there's being put because one person made a huge disaster in society, and now the stigma is put on so many other innocent, good, well-educated people. And coming back down to Africa, and coming back to the case of Ebola, well, the stigma is there, even for the ones who survived. But were there any positives, actually, of this campaign? I'm gonna mention one, maybe two. First of them was an exceptional, because that was the biggest epidemics ever recorded of Ebola. So one of the very positive things was a massive mobilization 
of different institutions, different organizations, which the attention was streamed, was channeled to the situation in Africa. Everyone would try to help to, to contain the crisis, Japan, Canada, all countries, many countries in the world. Another very important thing, I'm very happy to say, we were very close to getting a vaccine against Ebola. And that was created, that was the research and development, uh, let's say in this case, was sped up to an exceptional rate because just within six months we arrived at some trials in human beings. Normally it takes around 10 years to develop a vaccine. In case of this one, in case of this crisis, it took around six months. And this vaccine, if it works, is going to stay with us. So again, finishing off, I know my time is over, I wanted to take you for a short trip maybe not very exciting or maybe not very happy, joyful trip, but I wanted to bring closer to you the problem of this particular disease. But also keep in mind that smaller, similar, other crises, other diseases, when they hit particular populations, they get into the old thin and thick layers of human lives. Thank you very much.